Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Historic Property Survey Downtown Pueblo Project. Uh, the purpose of this today's meeting is to discuss about what have we learned. That's the theme for today. Um, and in our call here, we have several members of our, our Historic Preservation Commission um, and our, our, our lead consultant from Logan Simpson Design. And I'm just going to do some introductions, and uh, I might recognize some people uh, in the next few minutes as they join the call, and then we'll just stick with our agenda. Um, so um, we have on the call uh, Jen Lestick from Logan Simpson Design and Langston uh, Gissinger from Logan, Logan Simpson. If I mispronounce your name, please correct me. But uh, And then um, with our uh, Historic Preservation Commission, we got uh, Laurel Campbell, and Jason Falsetto, Gregory Howell, and on the phone is Anthony Perko. And also joining us are several uh, people who represent partner and stakeholder organizations who have supported this project from the beginning. We've got Ashley Winnens from NeighborWorks Southern Colorado, Arla Hendrickson from the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society here, and also associated on the board with the Heritage Museum. Uh, Aaron Ramirez, who is the lead uh, at the Western Collections at the uh, Pueblo City County Library District. We've got Glenn Valentine, who is a uh, consultant here in Pueblo. He's done a lot of work recently. He's helped Phil Zwick on the, um, the uh, Gateway to Southwest uh, sculptures. Um, we also have Stephen Trujillo, who is the executive director of the Latino Chamber of Commerce of Pueblo. Um, we've got Margaret Ward Maceus, who's the executive director of Downtown Association, and she's also retiring uh, after many decades of service, so congratulations, Margaret, and we hope you're still with us uh, in your volunteer time and maybe, maybe be a member of one of our commissions. We'll do what we can. Yeah. We also got Alyssa Mzdeke, uh, uh executive director of El Pueblo Museum, History Museum, which is a, a division of History Colorado, our, our state historical society. Uh, Listen is a, a new director uh, as of earlier this year, and, but she's already been a great member of the community with her involvement. And so uh, that's on her, and I'm Alan Lambert, uh, senior planner with City of Pueblo City uh, Planning and Community Development. And, um, and I'm going to, oh, I want to recognize Ms. Debbie, who, who's joined us? Is that Debbie, what's your last name? Well, it'll be hard to kind of. Wow, let's just, let's just get down to it. Okay, so um, so the next step is I do want to uh, I do want to acknowledge the everyone who has. Let me also acknowledge everyone who has uh, participated in the project. Um, but first, I guess we'll do is why don't why don't we uh, allow why don't we get the uh, let's get Jen and Langston to introduce themselves, um, and then we'll move on to slideshow. And I'll do the acknowledgments about the uh, everyone who's involved, and then we'll move on to your presentation. Does that sound good? Okay. So, and I think you got the share screen ready, so take it away. Sure. Um, I'll just briefly introduce myself, and then I'll let Langston talk really quickly. Um, so some of you, I believe, I met the last time. I was just telling Alan, it's been a year to this day since I was in the first time I came to Pueblo and did our first public meeting. So uh, this is our anniversary, it looks like. Um, my name is Jennifer Lefstick and I was the project manager um, and lead for Lucasen on this project. And um, I will now turn it over to Langston. Um, <clears throat> hello, my name is Langston Gettinger. Uh, Ellen, your pronunciation was close. No one has ever gotten it right before, uh, so well done. Um, I am an architectural historian and historic preservation specialist, also at Logan Simpson. I worked under Jen and did a lot of the background research and writing for this project. Okay. Uh, Jen, do you want me to, um, you want to kick on the slideshow? And then as you prepare to do that, I'll just briefly go with the acknowledgement for the project. Sure. Okay. So while, while Jen is preparing the slideshow, I just want to want to acknowledge uh, as quickly as possible all the all the people who we couldn't without their support we, this wouldn't be possible so uh, first of all this was paid for by in part by uh, history Colorado state historical fund grant 
uh, with additional funding from Pueblo City Council, Pueblo Urban Renewal Authority, his, uh, Historic Pueblo Inc., and Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society. Uh, project partners are many of the people on this call I've already acknowledged already, and the uh, Historic River Walk of Pueblo, his, um, the uh, Pueblo Arts Alliance, uh, Count, Pueblo County Department of Economic Development and GIS, uh, Pueblo Department of Health and Environment, the uh, Pueblo Lodge Number 90 with the Netherlands and Protective Order of Elks, and, and the Roseland Foundation, and that's in addition to everyone else on this call as well. Uh, we also, uh, I want to thank the Consultant Selection Committee that without, the, you know, for, for selecting Logan Simpson, you know, that was a good process. Uh, and that committee was Carla and Jerry from Urban Renewal and Shirley from County Department of uh, Economic Development, Maria Tucker, who was formerly with the library, uh, Margaret, um, Ashley, and uh, Lori Winter for Historic Pueblo Inc. And, and also during the... Um, when, when Jen and, and her colleagues were here in town and, and they went and endeavored to do the research, now this is the most important part, important part, and this is important for those who come out afterward in the future to know where to look for doing research. Uh, we have like this great history network in Pueblo, and I'm just going to briefly list them because a lot of these folks have helped our consultants on this project. That's uh, Colorado State University Archives, uh, particularly Beverly Allen. The Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Holiday Commission, that's Ray Brown and Ruth Steele. Uh, the Public County Historical Society and the Edward Broadhead Library, particularly Judy McGinnis. The El Pueblo History Museum, Devin Flores. His Historic Pueblo Inc., Corinne Taylor. Irish Club of Pueblo, Frank Kipple. The uh, Pueblo Library, Rawlings Branch, is Aaron, Martinez, or Aaron Ramirez. Uh, Pueblo Heritage Museum, Spencer Little. Pueblo Pioneer Cemetery, Joseph Talbot, Rose, Roselawn Cemetery Association, Lucille Corsentino, and the Steelworks Center of the West, also known as the CSNI Archives, Victoria Miller. And just want to acknowledge some volunteers, Glenn Valentine, who helped us with some video at the last meeting uh, a year ago, Ray Brown uh, for video, and my father, Walt Lambert, who was an editor uh, doing some proofreading, uh, Todd Pasquin, owner of the Federal Building, and uh, also the, um, and at the State Historical Fund, uh, History Colorado Center, Jennifer Diekman, Survey Specialist, uh, Cammie Harris, Grants Contracts, and uh, as well as Corbin Pugh. Um, and then here in my department, I also want to acknowledge Bill Zwick, who has been a mentor for me on this project. Uh, he was a capital projects manager, and, um, and Bill just retired after 32 years of service to the city of Pueblo. And, you know, he's... He's moving on to some good things, too, in his life. This whole Act 3 in his uh, life is going to be great for him, too. So I, I definitely want to thank him for his uh, guidance on this as well. Um, as well as our staff, all the way from the mayor's office to the chief, all the way down to, uh, to my director, Scott Hobson, my former director, Stephen Meyer, uh, our departments of the information technology for their outreach, and uh, departments of finance, law, planning, community development, and purchasing. And lastly, Logan Simpson, uh, design. Uh, just want to thank uh, your boss, uh, your bosses, uh, Eric Loria, and uh, who's the principal there. And again, um, also uh, Rosemary Pavel, Rosemary Pavel, who was uh, uh, also on staff before she uh, I left Logan Simpson. She was involved in this project before that. And also want to thank again uh, to Jen and Langston for your hard work on this project. And I'd like to yield the floor. Jen and, right. and All right, great. Um, so a bunch of new faces this time since the last time I was here. So um, I'm going to just briefly go over um, our project and the bulk of the discussion today, Langston's going to take over in part because a lot of the archival research was performed by him and also by Rosemary, who was with us um, earlier during this, this project. So as many of you know, um, in 2018, there was the first phase of this two-phase um, architectural survey. During that time, there's about 157 or so properties that were either intensively surveyed or were subject to a reconnaissance survey. Within those pro uh, numbers of buildings in the downtown area that were part of that reconnaissance survey, 
uh, Logan Simpson in consultation with City of Pueblo staff, um, Alan in particular, we arrived at 15 properties within those boundaries from the previous survey that we um, identified for what's called an intensive level survey. So we had 15 buildings that we were going to do intensive level survey for. And then in addition to that, we were also asked to create a more detailed historic context that looked at um, the sort of ethnic history of Pueblo as well as some of the downtown business and development history. So we had two pieces that we were charged with doing. Today, we're really only gonna talk about the inventory. Um, the history um, portion of our report is um, pretty detailed and would uh, last longer than this meeting. But I would encourage all of you to take the opportunity to look at the report. All of this material is available online. So if you would like to read um, a much more detailed history of your community, as well as um, a detailed history of each of these buildings, I would encourage you to look at that. So as part of the inventory efforts, our field methodology, there are several things that we did um, in order to accomplish this intensive level survey for these 15 properties. And the picture here, most of you are familiar with the Elks property, which is one of the buildings that we inventoried. Um, as Alan mentioned, there was a number of um, repositories um, that we consulted that were part of this project that really uh, aided the information that we were able to find about a lot of these properties historically. So one of the things that we did prior to going into the field was we started doing archival research so that we had a pretty good grasp of the kinds of historic resources that we were about to look at. When we were in Pueblo, our in, uh, field survey included, um, they're, they're basically, they're called intensive level survey forms that they are created by our History Colorado um, uh, department and they're anywhere from you know five to ten pages long worth of documentation that so we have a minimal requirement to fill out those but as part of those efforts we are architecturally documenting the building we're looking at changes to the building over time we're looking at the setting we're looking to see if there's streetscape features associated with the building so like trees lighting seating those kinds of things in addition to that we also take photographs <clears throat> excuse me we take photographs of all sides of the different elevations of the building that are visible from the street or that we have access to. Included in that then is then a history of each of those, those properties and looking at how each of those properties is related to one another and the distance from one, one another. Um, and those, that, that's sort of the nutshell of what we did when we were in the field. And once we were done with field work, we went back into those libraries since we had a better sense of those properties and then we started doing further research. Um, sorry, this map's a little, little tiny, um, but uh, just to give you a sense of kind of the, the geography of where we're working, again, this is in a relatively concentrated area in downtown Pueblo. Um, there are some streets where we have more properties concentrated and then a few properties that are kind of outlying it. But again, these are ones that were uh, subject just to reconnaissance. So basically only preliminary information um, previously existed about these properties during that 2018 survey. So in part, we are looking at kind of filling in the gaps of what had been started previously. And then, so we're going to talk about a little bit about the results. And this is where um, Langston is going to chime in here in a second. But just generally speaking, the properties that we looked at, the youngest, or excuse me, the oldest property dated to 1890, and the most recent property dated to 1966. And we had a, a pretty large variety of architectural styles and time periods um, so that we weren't looking at, let's say, a cluster of neoclassical buildings. Instead, we'd have, you know, a one or two, and then we had a couple modernist buildings as well. Um, and many of those are kind of on the outs outskirts of this cluster. Um, in addition to that, we were also looking at um, whether or not any, <clears throat> any of these buildings could be eligible to the various registers, either a local register, local landmark designation, for example, whether or not they would be eligible for designation at the state level, and ultimately designation for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. So we were evaluating that eligibility on an individual basis, whether or not each of these buildings could be eligible in and of themselves because they were significant by themselves, or whether or not these buildings could derive significance from their association with other buildings, basically whether or not they could be part of a historic district 
maybe in and of themselves, they weren't that significant, but if they are looked at in the sort of a, in a larger picture, their association with other buildings from similar time periods in the similar location would, would allow them to be eligible as part of a historic district. And with that, I'm gonna move it over to Langston. <clears throat> and Langston, you can just tell me when you want me to go to the next slide and I'll move the slides. But oh, uh, Langston, Langston did the, the Langston actually and Rosemary were the ones that did the bulk of the archival research. And so I wanted Langston just to be able to just briefly go over some of the properties that we looked at, um, just so you guys have a, a better sense of the, what the individual properties looked like and a little bit about them as buildings and their history. All right, Langston, it's all up to you. Um, I'm gonna try really hard to be brief. Um, I did a lot of research on these buildings and am quite fond of some of them. So if I uh, belabor your patience, I apologize for that. Um, I also realize I'm talking to a panel of experts here and many of you may know some of the stuff I'm going to be telling you, so um, bear that in mind. Anyway, with that said, we'll dive right in here. We're gonna talk first <clears throat> about the Hill Lyman Block, also the White Triangle Block, located at 101 North Main Street. Um, this building was constructed, you wouldn't know it from looking at it, but in 1891, when it was designed by architect Otto Bulow, who also designed the Mineral Palace, formerly located in the Mineral Palace Park and since um, demolished. Uh, this building was designed in kind of a neoclassical style. Uh, Bulow liked these sort of fanciful touches. So there was a turret on it, I think. There's written descriptions of this. I think there's a photograph out there somewhere too, which I couldn't find. Um, Regardless, uh, these were kind of stripped away by 1921 when there's a really striking photograph of this building after the 1921 flood. And you can see it was all brick. It kind of was uh, late 19th century commercial style. It was relatively somber, but had pretty, um, you know, brickwork masonry elements going on. Um, it was dramatically remodeled in 1966 by the architect James Holst. Uh, Holst designs owed a lot to international modernism and new formalism. Um, it, this is a really good example of how uh, international styles like new formalism, which, you know, you can associate with the World Trade Center, old World Trade Center, or um, the Lincoln Center, how it kind of filters down and has evolved into the really local uh, vernacular buildings of Pueblo. Um, let's see, sorry, I have a whole list of notes here, and I just saw someone say, this is great, thank you. <laughs> um, Anyway, we're going to go on to the Amherst building, which is below it. Uh, this was arguably the most complicated building we researched, and that five to ten page form that Jim mentioned earlier was 22 pages in this particular circumstance with the amount of writing and photographs involved. Um, I could spend a really a great deal of time talking about this building. I'm going to try not to. Uh, it was constructed between 1902 and 1907. The state records disagree, and the reason we think they disagree is because this building was actually constructed in two parts, a western part and an eastern part, which is borne out by the 1904 Sanborn Fire Insurance maps, which show a three-story building in the west and a one-story building in the east, and also architecturally. If you walk along the side of this building, you can't really see it in this photograph, but the two westernmost bays, which is kind of a, it's a, it's a vertical unit to talk about building facades, those bays are slightly different. The ornamentation is slightly different. There's, you know, floral swags and the window surrounds are a little different. It's not quite the same. And furthermore, if you look at an aerial on Google or something, you can see a parapet wall separating the two sides. Regardless, um, from what we know about it, one section of the building, or both, were not quite clear, were designed by a pretty prominent local architect, Francis W. Cooper. And Cooper designed a number of buildings throughout Pueblo. I think there are at least 14 that have been documented, there might be more, and several of them have been uh, listed on the National Register of Historic Places, including the Mason's Mechanic Building, which is immediately behind the Amherst Building. You can kind of see the outline of it there. Um, Cooper was commissioned to design this building by George Whitcomb, also famous as the Whitcomb Block. Whitcomb was an Eastern real estate magnate who owned a lot of property in Pueblo and Seattle. Um, and developed a number of these kind of two-part commercial blocks in the late, 18, late 1890s, early 1900s. Um, this building cost around $100,000, and it is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, use of an internal steel frame building in the city of Pueblo, uh, which, as you probably know, is you know, the basis for all modern uh, vertical construction. Any skyscraper has an internal steel frame. This is one of the early instances we see its use in Pueblo. Um, I'm going to move off from that, although I could keep going because there's a lot there. Uh, onto the upper right, we have the um, 
Amherst Building Annex in the Butler Building. This is really directly related to Amherst Building. It's located immediately west of it, and it's tied to it not only physically, but also architecturally, historically. It was constructed, we think, around 1907. A lot of this is Pueblo County Assessor's documentation, and uh, that info is sometimes um, suspicious. Um, but it's around 1907 and seems to have been used as a warehouse, likely for early tenants of the Amherst Building, which included a dry goods store and a, a later the Cruz Bex department store. Um, this building is in really good shape. It doesn't seem to have been dramatically altered over the course of its existence. And it's kind of interesting because it, it takes Cooper's design from the Amherst building and continues it along for those two bays in the ground story. So you see the, um, those red pilasters are copied over, the frieze goes all the way over. It's, it's all handled in brick instead of stone, but it's still you know, clearly showing the influence of the other building. Um, below that, I'm sorry, I'm speeding through these right now. I apologize. Uh, is the, it's 225 West 2nd Street, also a good building. Um, this building was constructed between 1915 and 1927. The assessor says 1915. 1927 is what earlier surveys of this building say, and I believe is the first time this building appears in the city directories. Um, as far as we know, this building was constructed for use in Colorado Laundry, uh, which used it as a garage. It would have held wagons, delivery wagons, and later um, delivery trucks. It was utilized in that capacity until 1972, at least, and probably through 1975, when the Colorado Laundry Company folded. Um, as you can see, kind of see in this picture, the main doors there have side lights on either side and a little top uh, transom, and all of that would have originally been a garage door. It also had chimneys, and it had some shed roof additions off the side, likely to store more vehicles. Uh, Jan, let's go on to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, 209 to 219 North Grand Avenue, the Grand Lindell Center. Um, this is another good example of a national style coming to Pueblo. This building is kind of reminiscent of Mission Revival architecture, which you can see in sort of the stuccoed elevations that really like a decorative parapet with the pierced holes in it, kind of like a, like a Spanish mission bell tower. Um, this was constructed, we think, around 1930, according to Assessor's Info again. Uh, it has an unusual footprint due to the former presence of a railroad alignment that went past it um, behind it. You can't see it in this image. It's on the site of a former warehouse and likely had some relation to the railroad, but we couldn't ascertain formally what that would be. The railroad spur line was removed between 1970 and 1974, and the property behind was purchased by this owner who extended a kind of a lot back there, and there's some additions that have been constructed off the building. Um, I'm going to go to the upper right now. This is the Hendry and Boltoff Supply Company building. I like this building a lot. Um, this building, Hendry and Boltoff, was founded uh, during the Colorado Gold Rush in the mid-19th century uh, to serve local demand for mining equipment. The company relocated its headquarters to Denver, um, but by the 1930s was trying to diversify its product line and attract new business due to the rise of automotive culture and changing times. Um, because of this, they opened a number of branches in, throughout Colorado as well as uh, Nebraska, New Mexico, and South Dakota. Um, this building was built in 1935, 1937, I believe, excuse me, in kind of this geometric Art Deco style. And there's some historic photographs of it that are really beautiful. It had really beautiful brick masonry detailing. It had this wood door with glass panes. It, they put a lot of effort into it. And really, um, this hasn't been well documented yet, but it seems like Henry and Boltoff put a lot of effort into a lot of their branch offices and stores. They were all relatively high style examples of architecture. Uh, I'm just thinking particularly of one in Durango, which is a really great example of an international modernist used in a um, store or commercial setting. Um, this building, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your subjective view of history, was utilized uh, by the Pittsburgh Glass Company in 1958 to produce plate glass and seems to have changed the whole front store uh, to plate glass windows, likely to advertise their products. Um, this took away a lot of the detailing on the building, some of which may still be visible behind uh, the awning, but um, hopefully they sold a lot of glass because of it. Um, I'm going down now to the bottom left, 304 West 4th Street. As you can kind of tell from this picture, this building is actually the very end of a longer building. We were asked to just assess this little bit on the end, um, and it's much more kind of a streamlined, modernist design. The, stripped away a lot of the ornamentation, those applied pilasters, um, nothing too decorative. Um, this building was hard to research. We thought it had a lot to do with the Owen Ferris Motor Company. It shows up in some advertisements, at least the side of it does, but um, based on historic images, uh, 
this building wasn't updated to look like this until after 1957. And in the late 1950s, Owen Pharisee sold, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, I apologize if I'm not. Owen Pharisee sold the, this particular um, dealership to his brother, Roland Pharisee, and Roland later left it, I believe, by 1966, uh, when the building was documented as an Avis rented car location. Um, we can go on to the bottom right, the uh, PBMT building. This is another great building. Um, as many of you likely know, PBT has a very storied local career since its founding by former Governor Alva Adams in 1889. Um, <clears throat> early banks often served kind of different customer bases, and PBT specialized in miners and ranchers. Uh, they were kind of original location and they moved to the Whitcomb Block, uh, really in central commercial Pueblo. Um, and it stayed there through the mid 20th century. At that time, the building was probably looking quite outdated. And particularly as a bank, you want to have a fresh image because you're storing people's money. And so at the time, the decision was made to upgrade the building and move to a new headquarters location. Um, current bank president at that time, Ted Swanson, I think, it's very deep in my notes here, members of the Adams family who controlled um, part of the bank traveled to Minnesota to view a bank designed by architect uh, Russell Barr Williamson. Uh, Williamson was born in Kansas, but spent most of his career in Minnesota and was associated with um, Frank Lloyd Wright, he spent some time at Taliesin East, uh, did some work on Wright's design for the Imperial Hotel in uh, Tokyo, and then supervised a lot of the Wright's firm's projects within uh, Milwaukee. Um, Russell Bar Williamson had apparently constructed a larger version of this bank somewhere in Minnesota. Um, I could not figure out which bank this was or where it was. I, I searched banks in Minnesota and it didn't come up. Um, apparently, the folks from Pueblo liked this bank and commissioned Williamson to produce a smaller scaled down version for Pueblo. This bank had a pretty complicated program when it was first designed. It served as a headquarters office. It had a banking call, a banking hall. Um, it had, you know, security and vault activities. And then it had a drive through uh, banking system at the back. You can't see it, but this building is pie shaped. There's a rounded back and the rounded back was for drive through banking. Um, it was elaborate and complicated and served in this capacity through 1973 uh, when a facility was opened nearby. It was constructed in 1960. I don't think I mentioned that. Um, after 1973, the drive through portion was enclosed and there were other changes made to the building's envelope and so it doesn't look quite the same as it did according to Williamson's design. Uh, Jim, let's go into the next slide here. Okay, 412 to 414 North Santa Fe. Um, this is not quite clear from this photograph, but that's the building on the right there with the, with the five small windows in the second story. Um, yep, that one, thank you. Um, uh, this is sometimes referred to as the TJ Downen building, which is not quite correct because it seems like Downen only lives there for five years and that was at least two decades after the building had been constructed. The building was constructed prior to 1883, likely between 1873 and 1883 but we can't trace things back much further than 1883 due to the lack of um, historically accurate Sanborn fire insurance maps in a lot of circumstances. Um, this building was part of an early building boom along North Santa Fe Avenue. It was brought about by the arrival of the first railroad line. Uh, as you can see, this building has been really dramatically altered. As it was constructed, it was a pretty typical example of a late 19th century commercial block, a two-part block. It would have had some Italianate influences. It would have looked very uh, Victorian, it would have had a lot of ornamentation and a cornice line, masonry. It had these huge ground story storefronts uh, that, you know, literally expanded up half of the building's height. Um, sometime after the 1950s, all of that was covered up and the current iteration of the building was created prior to 1998, I think, is when we found photographs of it. Um, going to the right here, 107 to 109 West 6th Street. This is a nice a uh, little building here constructed around 1923, according to the Pueblo County Assessor. Um, this is built in a very stripped down, kind of streamlined modern style. It has two storefronts. That composition has stayed the same, although some of the windows have been changed and at least one of the doors may be built. Um, it's a nice little building. There's not a whole lot going on with it. Uh, we're going to the bottom left. <clears throat> this building is also very complicated and has a really excellent um, nomination form that was written on it for the Pueblo uh, Cultural Resource Inventory, I believe by one of the people on this call right now. So that was, I was delighted to find that. Um, as you probably all know, this was originally constructed in 1881 by a French immigrant, Numa Vidal, to the designs of architect R.C. Eberly. 
Uh, Everly was a Denver architect and seems to have not supervised the construction of the building. It was supervised by the firm Cooper and Todd. Cooper, we've already mentioned in conjunction with the Amherst building, he's the prominent local architect. I will comment again with this building. Todd is interesting. Todd seems to have been Serena A. Todd, uh, who appears to have been a practicing female architect in the late 19th century in Pueblo. I have done some background research on her. Nothing has come up so far. Uh, she doesn't show up in census records or cemetery records. Um, it's a story that needs to be written and that doesn't seem to have a whole lot there um, so far. Uh, regardless, the hotel didn't seem to do very well. In 1904, it was sold to the Elks, uh, who commissioned their fellow Elks member Cooper to redesign the interior of the building to suit the needs of their social organization. Uh, this was done for $12,500, and then Cooper was again commissioned in 1913 to redo the exterior of the building in its kind of present iteration. Um, this building has undergone a lot of changes since that time, particularly with its windows and doors, and it had a porch filled in, but the the facade itself, the terracotta facade, is really in excellent shape and it's really an outstanding example of kind of early 20th century neoclassical design within Pueblo. This building is also interesting to me, at least for its lighting elements. If you walk by it, it has little light bulbs that were originally designed to go all over it and must have looked really like really something uh, when its first design lit up. Unfortunately, I could find no nighttime shots of what that might have looked like. Um, <clears throat> over to the right of it, the Clevenger building at 620 North Santa Fe. Uh, this building was constructed in 1928 for Mac V. Clevenger. Uh, Clevenger was born in 1888 or 1890 in Utica, Kansas, and came to Pueblo as a cowboy or ranch hand before becoming a used car salesman in 1917. Um, Clevenger participated in the groundbreaking of this building, uh, which would act as an auto showroom for him. He seems to have rented out at least one or both of the upper stories. There are records of tenants, including the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, who were located there. Um, this building is one of several buildings that helped make North Santa Fe into kind of Pueblo's automobile road or a number of auto showrooms, including this one. Uh, this one seems to have functioned, uh, been used by Clevenger through 1959 when he retired and remained an automobile showroom, perhaps under different owners, uh, from 1977. Um, after 1991, this building was utilized by the Colorado Lottery before it was transformed into the Connect School, which it currently is in 1993. Uh, the building envelope is in pretty good shape, as you can seeing this picture part of it had fallen at the time this photograph was taken, but uh, the windows have all been changed after 1988. Um, and so we used to have these white windows with panes and you know, nice showrooms and those are uh, since gone. Um, let's go on to the last and final page here. Okay, we're almost there. <laughs> um, 620 through 624 North Main Street. This is a, another favorite building of mine. This one is fascinating. Uh, we were commissioned to only research the yellow part of this building, kind of the tan part. Um, if you look closely, that facade actually extends all the way to the other corner of that white building. This is one complete facade. It looks like one building, but actually covers three separate buildings, all constructed in the late 19th century. Um, interestingly, the furthest right building, the white part, backs onto the original 1882 Pueblo City Hall and Fire Department. <clears throat> Forgive me, I haven't talked this much in months, I think, um, which uh, was an interesting building. There are photographs of it, and I believe if you walk around the back of that building, you can see parts of its stone foundation are still present. Um, the parts we wrote about are the yellow portion, the middle building, and the furthest left building. Uh, those were constructed, the north building was constructed in 1883, the south building, the middle building, was constructed in place of an earlier building between 1886 and 1889. Um, both buildings were strong examples of kind of late 19th century commercial architecture, very similar to uh, North Santa Fe, that building we talked about, the stuccoed, uh, until around 1922. Now, a 1922 photograph shows that the city hall has that current facade on it that was put there, and the other two buildings don't. After 1922, someone seems to have come along and completed this grand project to make that unified three-story facade across all of these buildings. You'll note that the building behind it, two-story buildings, I haven't figured out how they put a three-story facade onto a two-story building. I'm very curious. I don't know what it's like on the inside. If anyone has more information, I would be fascinated. Um, regardless, uh, these buildings aren't in great condition, though it still seems like there's a lot left from that 1922 model. There may be historic windows behind the plywood. Uh, we unfortunately couldn't tell. Um, Moving on from that to the right is the Firestone Building at 301 West 
8th Street. Uh, this building was constructed in 1932. We're also using kind of a geometric art deco design that again is very filtered down from you know, the more high style examples of it you would have found in, in New York uh, or Los Angeles. Um, this building was constructed as a fire sound service station and has served in that capacity since that time, which is kind of amazing. Unfortunately, um, or fortunately, depending on your subjective view of history, uh, the addition off to the left-hand side of it was constructed in the mid-90s, uh, which lessened the historic integrity of this building. It doesn't quite look like it would have looked in the 1930s onwards. Um, finally, we have 209 West 7th, James uh, Black Swan Cafe. <clears throat> this building was constructed as two separate storefronts in 1921. Originally, it was surrounded by a bunch of urban development, houses, apartments, shops. Um, most of this has been demolished and replaced by parking lots. Um, uh, since the 1970s, the building has been continuously operated as a locally owned restaurant, including the El Camino restaurant related to Lake Jane's Black Swan Cafe after 1983. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a number of changes to the building, and so I believe we listed it as a non-contributor to a potential historic district. We'll get onto that slide, I believe, next, if you want to transfer it, Jen. I'll go on to the next slide, sorry. Oh, oh yeah. okay, sorry. <laughs> He's looking at my face, not at the screen. Um, all right, as you can see here, we have a table with the addresses of these buildings. There are uh, History Colorado assigned numbers, a short description, and then how we recommended they be treated in terms of national and local register eligibility. Most of the buildings that we assessed, we recommended for inclusion in a potential historic district. I believe Jen will talk to you more about that. Um, a couple of the buildings we recommended as individually eligible for the National Register due to generally their architectural merits. That included the Amherst Block, which had been previously assessed by prior consultants and assessors as eligible, as well as the Elks Club or Elks Lodge, um, which has also been previously assessed. Um, looking through this, there were a couple of buildings that we didn't think would qualify for anything uh, that included 412 to 414 North Santa Fe. There was a tantalizing idea that you could take the stucco off that. There might be rich more brickwork underneath, but that's a later project and a future, a future assessment. <laughs> um, also, James Black Swan Cafe, as mentioned. And I believe the rest we thought were all possible for inclusion on a, in a district. With that, Jen, I will pass it back to you and thanks some more. Great. Great. Thanks, Langston. Um, summary. So as a result of this inventory and the, you know, we briefly went over some of the national register, local state designations. Um, let me just actually, let's, let's just scroll back to our map just so you have a better visual when I'm talking here. Um, so this is basically, you know, so this is our survey area. And the thing that we were most interested in was whether or not they, the 15 properties that we looked at in combination with the 157 that were inventory previously was whether or not between those two phases of this survey, whether or not there was enough historic fabric to, um, well, there's enough historic fabric within the existing buildings within the downtown core, but also whether or not they had enough integrity, meaning is there, are these buildings um, able to express their significance as a collection of buildings? Do they share similar themes, similar time periods, architectural styles, if their architectural styles are different, do they show a continuum over time? And whether or not as a collection, those could be a historic district. The previous um, survey recommended that this the survey area has the potential to be a National Register Historic District. And they basically were recommending that this area, largely the area that we survey, this more concentrated area rather than a larger um, downtown area, be, uh, they recommended that there's, there's the potential for it to become a historic district. And through our survey, where we kind of went and filled in the gaps a little bit, we concurred with that original finding is that we felt like with these 15 properties, two of which we felt were not eligible to any register, which is a pretty low number, um, but that certainly at the local level, these buildings with the other buildings that are that are that were previously documented together, we feel like there would be a really strong historic district. Um, 
We also feel that um, there is the potential to look at some different areas of significance. So the original area of significance recommended was what's called criterion A. So if you look at the National Register of Historic Places Bulletin, when you list historic properties, there are four categories that you can list those properties under um, criterion A, which basically it is, is it associated with broad patterns of history or historical events? B, associated with significant persons in our past, or uh, C, um, associated with a master architect, or it's a representative example of, a, of um, a, a particular type or method of construction and criterion D, which is can it inform on, on history or prehistory. Typically D is associated with archeology. span So when we're doing built environment studies, we rarely use criterion D unless there's an archeological component. So the 2018 um, survey suggested that criterion A, which is associated with broad patterns of history, so primarily looking at the commercial development of Pueblo through its downtown core, is that that was the area of significance. And again, um, we concurred with that recommendation. However, we did feel that in addition to a, you know, a couple of buildings like the Amherst Block, for example, or the Elks Lodge, are really good examples of that criterion C. So, um, they're really good representative examples of uh, masterworks um, and architectural design. Uh, yes, you know, places like maybe the Black Swan Cafe or um, some of the other small kind of nondescript buildings are less likely to fulfill that categorization. However, with you also then take in consideration the additional properties that were previously inventoried that are really good examples of sort of Victorian architecture, neoclassical architecture, um, that I, we do think that there is a really good case to then look at the architectural significance of the downtown core as well. At the most sort of minimal level that we would recommend that with these two phase, the two phases of these surveys brought together that you have easily, you have a significant local historic district and certainly at the state level. At the national level, we feel that minimally you have a district that's eligible for um, the National Register under Criterion A, but we would recommend that maybe additional research be done to look at the architectural history of that downtown core to see if that Criterion C would also be an applicable um, component of a National Register district. But in some, I mean, we feel like you have a great downtown, there's lots of great properties there. And even though I understand that there's concern that there's sort of disinvestment in the downtown and that there are windows that are boarded up and not all of the buildings are being utilized, the fact of the matter is, is that a, a vast majority of them have, you know, the major, the, the vast majority of them have um, a really good percentage of their historic fabric left. It's they still read as historic buildings. Um, and a lot of times too, we have to consider the fact that commercial properties, as Blankston had brought up earlier, is that commercial properties do have a, a need to update their facades. Um, and that would be, you know, the average pattern for commercial properties is about a five year window before they need to update their facade to bring in new customers and to present a more modern appearance that is enticing to whatever that the sort of the shopper is of the day. And so we need to sort of consider the fact that Commercial districts are living, breathing, and moving all of the time, and so that we can't expect that they're going to be like a bug in amber, where it just stays like that forever. So we kind of felt like some of the changes that had been made to some of these buildings, even though, let's say, there's stucco on a building that wasn't there historically, the stucco is part of that continuum of changing these buildings to, to accommodate changing interests, styles, aesthetics, and so on, and also a way to attract customers. And I think with that, I think we're uh, running over our time, which we knew we would, but because <laughs> there's plenty to talk about. So I think what I'll do then is um, I will minimize this and I'll turn it over to Alan if he wants to start any kind of the discussion portion. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Langston. Great. Um, let me... Okay. Okay, so. I've taken note of some initial questions by our listening audience, so mm -hmm. I will, uh, I will, uh, let me unmute, let me make sure to unmute Anthony so, so that way he can shine, there we go, okay. So, um, I, so before we, uh, 
we de I am definitely taking note of some initial questions, but before we do that, I want to give I want to give some um, some of our the people in our audience who are stakeholders a chance to weigh in um, on what they've learned from this project. Um, starting with um, our members of our Historic Preservation Commission, um, Anthony, uh, would you mind um, since you want to? Yeah, I'm going to start with Anthony, alphabetical order. So. Yeah. Although it's possible, I think it's connecting via computer. So let me start with uh, Laurel. Laurel, you want to share your, your thoughts on this? Unmute. You got to unmute. There. There we go. Okay. 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 I appreciate the work. Um, good job. I was a part of, uh, you know, the historic North Side and, and a couple of other things. So I kind of know what was going on with it. Um, I still cannot believe the amount of stucco that's been put on our beautiful buildings. And I know that the, uh, the person that's doing it wouldn't want to have anything to do with this, <laughs> but um, you know, it, it, it would be my thought that uh, if we can put it on the, on the national register that possibly people or owners of the buildings could uh, use funding to bring back the front facades to what they actually were at the time. Uh, that's kind of my thought at this point. Yeah, if, if they are able to, let's say some of these properties, you guys move forward and you get these property designated, certainly if you do the National Register designation, which again, I'll remind everybody is actually less onerous than doing the local or state designation, um, but they would have the, um, they would be for rehabilitation tax credits. If they want to upgrade right. buildings. That's a great opportunity for them. The key, the, the key issue now with that stucco is that stucco is, um, is really unfriendly to brick. So you really need to find somebody who's qualified to remove it because people sandblast it off all the time. They actually do worse damage to the brick under yeah. when they remove that stucco. So that's, yeah. That's always a challenge. I mean, when I've seen, you know, people that have just sandblasted it off and then the brick is so porous that it ends up actually degrading faster. So yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, but yeah, you're right. There are, there are quite a number of really nice buildings that have, that have been, uh, yeah, stuckified. <laughs> Remodeled, I call it. Yes, there you um, go. That's a good yeah, one. Yeah. Well, I can say that uh, I'm sad that we didn't do this 20 years ago before the stucco happened um but we we had what is what it is what it is and we'll we'll work with it but uh i do believe that we'll have uh you know a more beautiful downtown something that people will actually pull off the highway to see when we get this going so thanks thanks Earl. um sure. jason you want to you got some thoughts to share i really do echo laurel sentiments um thank you all very much for the efforts that you've put into this I see so much potential for our downtown to be reborn, and this is a great first step towards that. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Gregory, check the chair. Sure. Um, one, having lived in the historic Tut building for six years at first in Maine, um, you know, it really did draw my attention. I mean, the stucco, of course, I mean, we have so many extraordinary buildings just right on Central Plaza, which of course was my focus of emphasis for those six years. But having done all of those walking tours, you know, throughout that area, um, you know, now having just such a great um, depth of understanding of not only just the integrity of the structures, but for me as a storyteller, understanding the stories behind the structures just gives it so much more capacity and critical mass moving forward. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about adaptive reuse of historic properties, economic redevelopment, and tourism, I mean, that's been my sweet spot globally, having worked with other cities and other governments around the world. So I'm just so excited because the work that you've done just adds so much capacity and bandwidth to where we need to go. So thank you so much. Thank you, Gregory. Um, uh, Anthony, all right. Anthony, are you on the call? Anthony Perko? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, very good. Hi. Would you like, would you like right, to great. share your thoughts? 
No, I'd like to basically join in the group, and uh, I appreciate every, all the work of that. I'm extremely excited for this project, and I uh, can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, let's see. I, I don't see any other members of the commission on the call, uh, but if I do, I'll, I'll, I'll loop them back in. I want to focus uh, briefly on our, our stakeholder partners as well. Um, is there anyone from Urban Renewal on the call at the moment? Can anyone join us from Urban Renewal? Because we got many, many people, so it's hard for me to track all the people who joined us. But uh, if so, just chime in anytime uh, if you're from our Urban Renewal. Uh, but uh, anyone from History, or History Web, Historic Pueblo Inc. Any, um, I know Carla is also, I think, associated with uh, his, uh, Historic Pueblo, but. But let's just start with Carla. Carla, do you have uh, do you have some uh, thoughts you'd like to share? I think she might have stepped up. Oh, um, no, I'm. Yeah, it's sort of a learning process, and I look forward to looking at the report in detail. I need to better understand the deterior um, takes away from that arch original architecture, but does it also have its own story that might be? Reasonable to try and incorporate as we move forward. Okay, that's a good brief point. So let me just reiterate that question. Um, so you're saying, uh, so Carla, you meant to the question of um, the alterations that have happened, which kind of contribute to a narrative of development, commercial development. Um, you, you were curious as to how that can. Uh, how the alterations that we've seen in the district could be kind of turned to support district nomination if, if the property owners decide to go with that. Is that, is that what you meant? Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if, is that possible? Is that another way of approaching it? Not, I'm not trying to dismiss, you know, the, the integrity that's been lost, but, you know, just to try and move forward. Is Jen, you want to speak to that? Yeah, um, no, I think that's a great point, Carla. Um, and that's something that we thought about too. And this is something that we see lots of cities grappling with, especially in this, you know, the, the Western United States and the South, Southwest where stucco became really popular everywhere. Um, and it is part, it is a sort of, it's part of that narrative that goes with many of these downtowns. And so it is part of the evolution of those, those downtown commercial centers. Um, I think Based on what we looked at, for the most part, we really only found a couple times where we really thought that the stucco was so detrimental that it really um, ruined the possibility of that building being eligible for designation on one of the various registers. Um, there are, you know, again, there'd be so many, you know, because we, we, without, you know, taking a chisel to it, we don't always know what's underneath it. And that's the challenge is that we have to look at it as it looks now. But I do agree with you that that is part of the narrative and that that in and of itself should not automatically disqualify it. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the route that we took when we did our evaluations. Ultimately, the, you know, the, the SHPO or, the, or History Colorado, you know, makes those kinds of determinations. So we did have some back and forth with them on it where we were, we probably were much more lenient where we would have said, you know, look, that's part of the evolution of this building over time in, in an effort to change its commercial facade to be relevant. And SHPO was a little bit more hard-lined about it and said, well, you know, you can't see X, Y, and Z because of this. And, you know, and we, we felt confident there's probably good historic fabric underneath it. So, you know, some of it is just keep in mind that, you know, there is the SHPO pushback that we had on a couple evaluations. But thankfully, it only resulted in, you know, a couple properties with stucco that really can't, at least currently, without additional information about what's underneath that facade, can't be listed currently. But that's not to say it can't change. So and that's, and that's a very long answer to your question. No, that's, that's good, Jen. I, I also think that um, that's also reassuring to the property owners because when I talk to the property owners in the, in the district, um, it helps to understand how things that have happened to the buildings during the historic period, not just from the 1800s, uh, but th and not just from the early 1900s, but through the mid-century uh, up until the 60s. There's a lot, there was a lot of changes, and maybe even as time moves forward in the next few decades, even the 80s will be a historic period into itself. So we, sh we should have some sensitivity towards that 
um, and maybe that might, you know, that could that could lend support for a district nomination if the property owners are into that, if they see the value of that, um, and and you know, capturing that as a historic context, and then you know, everything from then on, saying, okay, well maybe maybe we'll be take extra care uh, on these facades uh, going moving forward. So that's that's an interesting thought. Um, I'd also like to hear from some other folks in the, in the room here. Uh, we got Ashley Winnens from, oh yeah, Carla, Carla, did you have a follow-up question to that? Well, kind of. Are there good examples of communities that have been, have moved in that direction to look at as a model for a designation that incorporates a narrative of change as well as, you know, in, real integrity in, in what remains? So let me let's put a pin. That's a great question. So let, let me let me put a pin on that and let's revisit that later in this conversation. Okay, Carla, and I'll, I'll make sure we, we circle back to that question. Um, and then I'm gonna. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to take note of uh, um, our, our other colleagues in the call. Okay, sound good? All right. So, Ashley uh, Woodins from NeighborWorks. Any, would you like anything to share? I don't think I have anything major to add. I think it's an exciting prospect. Um, you know, we have a building down there that was designated historic. And so if there's more opportunity for others to do the kind of work we're planning, that would just add to the character down there. And that, so that, that's exciting for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. And yeah, the, um, I, I also want to acknowledge that uh, the work that NeighborWorks has done in, in the downtown, the main street, the old Wickhome block building, you know, they're all, they're moving in the right direction with their, their their tax credit application and their 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 design documents that they brought before the commission uh, fairly recently. So, you know, um, it just takes these things take time. But I just want to assure everyone listening that they're moving in the right direction. They uh, they've got the uh, approval from the our historic preservation commission. The, the construction documents look great, and and those are available. You know, if anyone wants to see that, you know, that's that's available. So I think that'll really help. Yeah. Um, Aaron Ramirez from the library, uh, would you like, please, uh, you know, you've been a great help to our consultants, and I think, would you mind sharing what you've learned from this experience? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, relatively new here as the manager of the department, but I'd just like to say thank you, uh, Langston, thanks for all your research, and Jennifer, thank you uh, for being involved in the project. Uh, I think just the, uh, I guess, the uh, accumulation or, or building the narrative of what happened with these buildings is, uh, a feat unto itself if it goes no farther than that like this is great uh, just for researchers uh, purposes I think it uh, builds a good base of knowledge there um, and I look forward to looking at the report uh, where can we find the report and uh, and how soon can we get a hold of that sure uh, I, yeah it'll be online uh, it's actually actually currently online at pueblo.us forward slash historic downtown and Towards the end of this presentation, I'll do a screen share so people can see that. Um, but again, for those listening, it's pueblo.us forward slash historic downtown. Um, and now, um, um, Stephen Trujillo from the uh, Latino Chamber, would you like to, sh do you have any comments to share? Any, anything, you, what, what you've learned from this project? No, uh, nothing, nothing to, to add other than, I mean, I've learned a, a whole lot. I mean, just the history of these buildings, you know, being from Pueblo, I think sometimes we take for granted the beauty that's around us as we drive downtown and pass the building. Uh, so what this has allowed me to do is to kind of more fully understand and, and appreciate those historic buildings and structures that we have and the businesses that are there today. And, and the one thing I'd maybe just add is just a food for thought because it hit me as we were talking through um, towards the end of the presentation about how some of these buildings as they're being renovated or modified, you know, may not be uh, may not be being done so in the best way to help preserve that. So I don't know to what extent this particular effort might be able to work collaboratively with the either the businesses that are there or the owners, or if a building goes up for sale, you know, can we give a little fact sheet that tells that next owner, hey, did you know what kind of building you have here? So that they're more fully aware of some of those things that they're about to do to the building. Um, you know, did you know that this building uh, housed this or did this? Or did you know that, you know, the history behind it? So before they just go covering up bricks or anything like that, they may 
you know, look at it a little bit different uh, from a different lens. I don't know. That was just one thing that hit me about, boy, I wonder if they would still do that if they knew to this extent and to the level, all of that there. And maybe they've just never asked. They've never, you know, come across it in a way. I mean, I know we've got phenomenal groups that go out and teach and do these things, but yeah. if that was lost in transmission from one owner to the next, how do we preserve that? Thank you, Stephen. That's actually one of the things that we want to, um, that we've been trying in the background getting these, the Historic Preservation Commission has these standing committees. So one of them is an education committee that, so as we get these committees off the ground and get them running, um, then we'll have some, you know, we, that might inspire more collaboration within the network of history organizations so we can get more volunteer activity and more outreach, more robust education in the community. And, that, that's, and ideas like that is what would drive it, I think. So, uh, Miss Margaret from uh, Downtown Association, would you oh, like? Alex, uh, oh, Alex. Oh, yeah. Sorry, can Sorry. I just chime in real quick, just to answer Stephen? Um, but yes, I think, please, please. I think your point about using the report, so property owners, so the, in the appendices of the report, when you guys get an opportunity to look at it, there are all of those inventory forms that um, Langston talked about, and in in, in every case in which we could find historic images of those buildings we have them in there so any any drawings any images things like that are all in there so that you could literally take that out of our report and hand it to a business property owner and they would have a full history of their building in addition to any images that we have so that they can just have they, they can know what their building might have looked like let's say if they bought it after let's say it got stuck up so that's great thank, thank you Jen. yeah that's that's part of the uh, education component then um, a lot of those photos that come with it, I, some of those photos are public domain, so we can always um, share those photos with anyone who requests them as well. Uh, Margaret, uh, would you like to share your thoughts on this project from what you've learned and um, what your, your colleagues in the Downtown Association Board have learned as well? Well, I, I would like to congratulate them. They did a very thorough job on, on these 15 buildings. Um, almost all of those buildings I had researched at one time or another, and most of them I found extra things that I could not find before. So, you know, it, it really is, is a great job of doing it. Um, I've spent 10 years writing a monthly column, which is about 120 on various buildings and businesses in the downtown area. So um, it was very interesting to, to see what they came up with. I would like to encourage the city to try to come up with a program that encourages property owners with the multi-story buildings to maybe put residential on either third and third through eighth floors or second through uh, whatever. Um, that's that's the only way we're really going to get a, a good retail base back in this area is if there are people in here more people to eat in more restaurants, more people to, to buy groceries. That's, that's gonna, uh, you can't get a grocery store unless you've got people who are going to buy groceries living in the area. And I know the people in the Amherst building are just hoping that, that uh, the Whitcomb block does end up with a grocery store. Mm, right on. But there, well, there's a Mark. lot of space here. And I think, I think there are some, some incentive programs out there that could be used to, to do something like that. that. That's definitely a conversation we want to continue to pursue. We want to explore and um, invite public and private partnerships to kind of introduce it, look, look at all the tools available, but perhaps look at new tools that might make things work better as well. Um, I know that speaking from my department and zoning, uh, mixed use, uh, we've clarified the mixed use um, uh, zoning, so it's very clear that it's a use by right in, in all these business districts to do residential on the upper floors. Um, so as far as zoning is, we're we're out of the way. Uh, we're, go ahead, <laughs> but uh, but there's so many other challenges to it as far as uh, building codes and and um, and just the contractors and they're they're you know they need to have the expertise to understand all the codes and and to and, and to, there's so much. But but it really just takes a collaboration in our community. And I think I think if we just get together, put our heads together. I think we can do it. Um, so, uh, Alyssa uh, from uh, El Pueblo History Museum, I see you're on the call there. Would you like to share what you might have learned from this project? Um, hi. Yeah, so I'm, I am pretty new to the project. I did look through some of the documents that you shared, Alan. Um, 
so I, I kind of just want to echo what everyone is already saying and, um, you know, I'm excited to learn more and um, see how I can be involved as we go forward. So, yeah, it's been helpful to, um, you know, learn about the buildings through the project too, since I am pretty new to town, so. Well, I, I want to say that El Pueblo History Museum is a great asset in the community. Uh, I, I just learned that, that El Pueblo is part of like an education committee that, that collaborates with the Arts Alliance and the, and the, and the San Cristo Arts Center and, and, the, and the education committee involves a lot of young people and that has to do with a lot of, you know, like social justice programming and, and, and education and um, about history and civil rights. And I, I think if we do more of that, where we collaborate with organizations and we just put our mind to it and be mission oriented, we can get a lot done. And I, and I see that happening with, with what El Pueblo is involved with. So I, I want to invite, you know, invite all of us to continue this stuff, especially when it comes to history and, and economic development. So thank you, Alyssa, for joining us. Yeah. Um, and then we've got, I think up on the call we have uh, Debbie. Is that Debbie Larson or, is that, uh, of, uh, or Debbie um, or the other Debbie? Please, please introduce yourself if, if you're on the call there, Ms. Debbie. Hi, yeah, it's Debbie Larson. Hi, welcome. Welcome back. Remember, we met you last year at yeah, the last meeting. Yeah, year. Yeah. So what, what, what would, would you like to share? Anything you've learned? Any comments? Um, I think it's been interesting. Obviously, it's next steps are really the important part. For, I mean, we're pretty far along in our project, so I don't, I don't even know if it's that helpful, but I hear a lot of like educating of, of the owners, but I think most of the people that own buildings in that area do know what they have. It's very expensive and it's been very challenging to have the building department and the contractors there locally and the owners all work together to find an economical, reasonable solution to bring things back because I, all the owners would love for their buildings to look like they did in those historic pictures, I'm sure. So this will hope, hopefully help that. And, and for those on the call, I wanted to do some background. Uh, Debbie and her husband, Tim, uh, with their consultants, they did some, some cool work in, with uh, regards to, uh, they had to do some ventilation uh, through the buildings to support their uh, remodeling and, and changing the use to do residential condos up above. So that requires ventilation. So they met with the commission uh, in, um, about a year ago and uh, worked with us and just did a little tweaks to kind of uh, reduce the impact. And they were really great to work with. Uh, her, I think your consultants were from, I think Denver, if I recall correctly. But yeah. between them and, and you, it, it, was, it was just, it was, it was a great collaboration. It just goes to show that what we can do is the process of design review is actually painless, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> so, I don't so we, know about painless. Yeah, well, for the, it wasn't that from, the from the HPC standpoint, right? <laughs> but uh, but it, it but it, it it accomplished our goal to you know to do what we can to preserve the exterior facades while accepting the alterations that are necessary for changing the use and getting them in there. So. That's a great, I think that's a good case study. I, I, I tend to refer to that as a nice, nice case study to share with people. So thank you, Ms. Debbie. I'd for you guys to see it when it's done in a couple months. Love it. We'd love to see it. Yes. Right on. Um, uh, and, and I see Heather, Heather Norton is on the call. Is that right, Heather Norton? And I, if you uh, unmute yourself, you can, um, let me click on the ask to unmute. There you go. Let's see. Ask to unmute. So when, when Ms. Heather unmutes herself, then she, uh, she's welcome to share. I, I know that she's been sharing some uh, comments that, and we can discuss that as well. But when you get a chance, there you go. She's connecting to audio right now. But uh, Heather had uh, shared some comments. Heather Norton was with us last year at the meeting, where she has some like knowledge about old, you know, older Pueblo from the eight, late 1800s, um, and even even knowledge of buildings that were existent. Uh, before the ones that are there now, and then also about, you know, history. So, let's see, she's got a message from her. She's having some trouble unmuting. I know, okay. yeah, yeah Ms. Ms. Heather, you're, it says that you're connecting the audio, and, and, I've, um, and, you're, 
and you're un oh, can you speak? Try again, Heather. You're you're not you're not muted. You're open you got an open channel. Although it looks like you don't have a microphone connected. So 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 unfortunately I think you got some technical issues, Heather, but um, why don't I convey what you're writing to us by comments uh, with the group, okay? Because it looks like your microphone's not quite connected, but that's okay. Let's let me let me help moderate uh, all the great comments you provided for us uh, via the text. So let me just start from the top, uh, since we have time, because it's um, we're on we're on schedule here. So um, so going from the top, you had mentioned that Heather had mentioned that for the um, the at the uh, the, at the um, Santa Fe location, uh, there was the Bartles and Morgan block from the early 1870s. Uh, that's about approximately 400 block of North Santa Fe, uh, the Bartles and Morgan block. And so there might be some information um, if, if it's not in the context, if it's not in the surveys, which are pretty thorough. But if it's not in there, maybe we'll take a look at the. Uh, the Sanborn maps and just see what else, you know, just to compare uh, Heather's notes as well. Um, she also commented that uh, on on 600 block of North Main, uh, she was uh, the name of that composite uh, that's next to the old city hall is the Craig block uh, from about 1873. And that will probably, if you look at a Sanborn map, that'll probably indicate that as well. Um, let's see. And then going on down the line here, she also said uh, there's a Chilcot block from 1874 on the southwest corner of 6th and Santa Fe, um, and also Judge Hallett block on 4th Street from about 1882, where the, where the Sons of Italy Lodge is currently is. Uh, the AC Foot block on southwest corner of 8th and Main 1883-ish, which is stuccoed over but might have integrity underneath. Also, maybe the circa 1886 Nussbaum block at the northwest corner of 3rd in Santa Fe. Not too bad, she says. Um, let me just, and as for, oh, uh, and then uh, Heather's last comment says, um, now she's just inviting some follow-up conversation with her sometime about the original building owners uh, because she has some his narrative history and maybe we can include that as part of the uh, like a what I'm what I'm thinking is any, if we find inf new information um, if we missed anything uh, or if we have more information we could also post that on the website as an addendum as well uh, because we do like to hear from everyone out there in the public and folks like Heather so we'll definitely um, look incorporate those comments. And I'll definitely, I'll have a follow-up phone conversation with Heather as well. Um, going on to other comments here, I saw, um, I saw uh, Ashley had wrote a comment. Uh, Ashley said that, um, oh, she was just talking to uh, Margaret there, answering Margaret's question. But, um, so that's all the comments I've got here. And again, let me just do a screen share of the uh, where to find this. So if you go to Pueblo.us, forward slash down, historic downtown, and it's, it's a shortcut link, and somehow my link got turned out, but uh, whoop, let me get down here. You scroll down, and there it is. Uh, it's got the introduction um, about the project. It's got links to the report uh, and the intensive surveys, and if you click on, importantly, if you click on that link for the intensive surveys, it shows all by street. So if you click on, say, Santa Fe, there's all the addresses, uh, and then you click on one, and uh, let's, let's, let's say Main Street, the uh, 620, that's the one we're looking at on Main Street, opens up a PDF, the very thorough architectural inventory form that uh, our, our consultants here did, architectural description, construction history, and historical background, a lot of information. Uh, some findings and photos, maps, and photos. So, including some historical photos as well. There's uh, the old city hall and fire station that they mentioned, which is adjacent to the uh, subject property. All right, so 
So that this is a I think this is a great resource for owners, business owners, property owners, business owners, citizens as well. Let me just get back to here and stop my screen share. There we go. Okay. I mean, somehow the lights went out. I don't know how that happened. Uh, any any other comments from the group here? Uh, Miss Heather, I see you're back. Did you have any Did you have any uh, further thoughts you wanted to share, Heather? Just chime in. My lights went out for some reason. All right. Well, anyway, anyone else on the call want to have any further? I just I just have one additional note, Alan. Um, yeah. Looking at uh, all of that information, we just finished a grant application um, for creating the first Pueblo Youth Docent Training and Certification Program with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And we partnered with PSAS Fulton Heights with Drew Hirschon. It's for K, four through eight. Um, but what we're gonna do is we'll actually have a training program and a certification program. So it will start at Water Tower Place, but then we plan to take it to all historic um, locations. So um, this information that you provided just is, is exactly what we'll need to the educational front for these students to learn how to do actual tours as a docent for historic property. So I love this concept, it's extraordinary. Great. Thank you, Gregory. Great. Um, any other questions? From, any other comments? Yes. Uh, any other, yeah. Yeah. Comments? Go ahead. Um, yeah, this is Laurel. Yeah. Um, I actually have a statement and a question, but my statement yeah. is, um, as a former real estate agent, I have tried for years to get uh, PAR, Public Association of Realtors, uh, to include in their disclosure documents something that's on the national, local, or state uh, registry. And I have given actual um, talks on architecture around Pueblo to certain real estate groups um, and, and also telling them that they're not, they're not advertising right, they're not using the right keywords or buzzwords to uh, uh, to make that property uh, interesting to someone. And I have found that lots of times, and, and I know some of these aren't on the register, some are, um, but you know, when, when they go to buy something, it's in their title work. I mean, who reads the entire title work? I don't think anybody does. But we, you know, giving them the history in a in a form you know like like the survey is an excellent idea and i still think that we need to push the the realtors to know what they're selling too they just don't realize it uh when i was doing real estate i my forte was historic homes the other thing i want to say is that it does anybody know if we can form a district if there is uh any way to forestall or stop stuckling of more buildings within a district even if they're I, I know that if they're not designated they can't probably do what they want but you know maybe form a group to educate i don't know how many more buildings could possibly be stuccoed i don't know but i'm just a really uh but the 60s 70s and 80s were awful to our older architecture you look at downtown denver i have a picture of of um, the uh, Capitol before it was even done, uh, my great great uncle walking up the steps. And in the background, probably about 1900, maybe a little sooner, are all these beautiful, uh, lovely homes, uh, and they're gone for urban renewal. I'm sorry, I'm just not a fan. Uh, but anyway, I, I would just love to, um, to know that, that in the future, there are people that can hopefully entertain the fact that this is not going to do us any good if you want to do that you know at least educate them so that that's just my comment on it so. well and laura i can add that it just happened on central plaza within the last month or two there's a huge new seco addition between the historic tut building um it's sad that building was not designated but to your point there's a huge where the transom windows used to be in between the brick and the new windows is a huge stucco swipe across the front of the building. And unfortunately, it looks like a cancerous growth. So I would wholeheartedly go in your direction if we could just educate. Uh, but just to your point, this just happened within the last month or two. 
Yeah, I did happen to see the interior. Uh, Emily Gratisar uh, and Joette from next door, uh, they, they just happened to be looking at the interior of that building, so they invited me and the other land use planners to check it out. So it is nice, though, to see uh, a vacant building that was boarded up, uh, vacant for many years, but then having some remodeling done and some tenant finishing and what they call white boxing, like Margaret, Margaret educated us on the white boxing concept where they fix up the interior uh, so that way someone can occupy it. Uh, but the interior, it looks like it's got some potential, you know, for some, you know, occupied or something. So we are nonetheless looking forward to getting those vacant buildings occupied for sure. And, but yeah, but as for the aesthetics, I mean, I, I do agree that it, it, it is up to our community and it is up to the members of the HPC and, and, the, and the education committee that would have partners in the community from other organizations to really get out there and and get it, uh, do it, be strategic in, in educating property owners and business owners on the value of, of, of the aesthetics. So that, I think that's worth looking at. Um, any other comments from our, our group here before I, uh, before I bring it back for closing? I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have Jen and Langston offer some closing comments, but I would really wanna make sure that everyone on the call has a chance to speak. So chime in if you wanna speak, and we're gonna, yeah, one more comment. Sorry, Laurel again. Um, we need to gear marketing. Uh, first of all, let me say that I don't know how much Pedco is involved with downtown. Um, I know they want to put people out at the airport, but man, it would be wonderful to bring people. I know there's businesses out there that enjoy the history and love the architecture. Uh, and if it can possibly be done, I think we need to push that with Petco to not have the empty spaces. Um, maybe we just need to, the education committee needs to invite Petco to a meeting, you know, and talk to them. So just my thought. Sure, and um, uh, Planning and Zoning is actually working on a, uh, a, a legislation, zoning tax amendment to provide for small scale production facilities in business zones, including his, the historic downtown area. And Petco has talked about some interest in, in what we're working on among other stakeholders uh, as, as is the downtown association. So real quick, just what that, what that means is small scale production is uh, you got your, you've got your, like think like Etsy producers, people who create products on Etsy and they sell them on the internet, right? You got your cottage industry, who, who might have your own, they might have an Etsy page and they might do something and they sell it, you know, here and there. And then you've got like industrial that do mass production and all with all the impacts and it's massive export. Then you got that middle area, small scale production, uh, where there's not necessarily any nuisance or negative impacts outside of that space that they're doing this production in, such as 3D printers or, you know, for example, people might do 3D printing and do like mass production of a product and assembly without any nuisance to the adjacent op op property owners. So we're writing something to provide for that, and we hope that that'll open the door towards, you know, reuse a lot of these for a lot of these buildings on the lower levels, which would then trigger economic development and more output for the community and, of course, the economy. So that's pay, you know, look out for that too. Um, I'll. Uh, I'll, I'll email everyone about that if you haven't seen it already, um, but thank you. Any other comments from uh, the group? Okay, okay, well, and, and if you do have, if you do think of something later on, you know, just, you know where to reach me. Um, but as for, I want to, I want to provide the closing comments to our colleagues, uh, Jen and Langston. Well, I'll speak first, Jen. Uh, well, I, it was a pleasure getting to research these buildings. I uh, just enjoyed it deeply. I'm sorry to not share board with you. I'm sorry if I bored you, but uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. So. I think you're still muted, Jen. How about now? It's very strange because it says I'm muted, even though I'm not. So anyway. Um, Anyway, I, I just uh, echo um, Langston's sentiments. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to work with this community. I really enjoyed my time in Pueblo. Um, you guys have really great buildings in town. 
And I'd certainly like to see that you guys um, be able to make some real strides toward revitalization and really being able to use your downtown. I do think that this document, in addition to the previous document, I think the combination of those things, you have a really good basis for creating a National Register nomination. I would really encourage you guys to pursue designation through the National Register rather than a local or state, but actually go do a National Register nomination. You pretty much have most of the history, all the documentation pretty much done for you. So somebody probably could compile that information and consolidate it into a National Register nomination. With that, you would be able to get that designation that you seek. And through that designation, it really will start giving you guys some teeth in which you can respond to incompatible alterations or demolitions or changes to your downtown area. Because right now, really, you have no regulatory authority to do anything about it. So if you have those designations in place, then that sets the stage for you to be able to create zoning ordinances where you actually can dictate whether or not stucco goes on something or not. Um, but those are, but in order for those kinds of things to happen that you guys want to see happen and the sort of the regulatory control that the city and, and this committee wants to be able to have in order to do that, that designation is the first step that you're gonna need to make. And I do think that you, you have the documentation there now. I think that you're able to do that um, successfully. And you know, the SHPO has reviewed both of them. They're familiar with the city, they're familiar with these properties. So they have a real sense of what this community is like. So I really think you have a, a good shot if you want to pursue this in the next couple of years. I think that's a good that's a good time frame um, to try to do that. So and I feel the best and certainly stay in touch with me um, if you ever have any questions about any of that. That's partly what I do too. So Wow, thanks again. Um, I, I just want to, I, I can't help but applause even though I'm the only person in this room, <laughs> but thank you so much for everyone. And thank you know, you. <laughs> you're always welcome back to Pueblo, uh, Jen, and, and Langston, uh, he has not been to Pueblo yet, but I think he, oh. he, he will probably make a stop yeah. here sometime. Yeah. We'll, you need to come we'll down and have some up. Pueblo chili. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm planning on it. Yep. <laughs> make a drive here shortly. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone, uh, and uh, appreciate your time. This has been a long, but hopefully satisfying meeting, and we look forward to continue discussions about this in the future. So thanks again so much for Great. all your hard work and all your listening and your sharing. So thank you so much. Great. Thank thanks, you, everybody. Alan. Thank yeah. you. And I, I want to say hello to all my commission members that I haven't seen for a while. We'll get we'll get together again. Oh yeah, July eighth. <laughs> Mark your calendar, July eighth. We need a quorum. Okay. Because History Colorado is going to be calling us, <laughs> Erica. <yeah. laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye.